Um, Brick by Brick is a compelling read about Karen's challenges in maintaining a healthy marital relationship and working on her career in international development. It's about her upbringing, how it has personally driven her, but more importantly, I thought it's about the stories of the women, the women that she's worked with and met and the impact that the women's stories has had on you and you on them. Um, it's the story of survival. Um, so before we get into the content of the book, I wanted to ask you a little bit about the nature of your work, um, what you've done in, over the years, and what it's involved and where it's taken you, if you could talk about that a little bit. Sure, well, good evening, everyone, and it's an honor to be here with you as well. Thank you so much. Um, so I've been in the field of international development for about 30 years now. I spent about 15 years working in the former Soviet Union, primarily with women who were transitioning, helping them transition from a plan to a market economy. You know, when the Soviet Union collapsed, you know, with it came everybody's jobs, their livelihoods, their sense of their future. And like many other countries, it was really women who were left to pick up the pieces. Um, and so I worked with women from Ukraine, Belarus, Moldova, the Caucasus, Central Asia, and Russia um, to really give them the tools to be able to participate economically. And it really sparked my interest in this idea of helping women transform their lives through economic development. From there, I spent uh, 10 years working with women survivors of war in conflict and post-conflict zones around the world all the places that you read about in the news every day, Iraq, Afghanistan, Congo, South Sudan, really some of the worst places on earth to be a woman. Um, and we put those women through a 12-month training program that was geared towards understanding their rights as well as vocational skills training and business training with the idea that access to knowledge and access to resources could create lasting change for women. And then, for the last six years, I've been the president of the Aquila Institute, which is Rwanda's only women's college. Um, and it's based around a whole education to workforce model, working with women who really never thought they might ever go to college, uh, half of them being from rural areas, 78% of the first of their families to actually go to college, and giving them this life-changing education where they're linked up to the workforce. And so, sort of the roots from the former Soviet Union on through Aquila, you can see the kind of the, the themes there. Um, can we move to the book then? Absolutely. Let's talk about Absolutely. the book. Um, the book is about a significant decision you made to move your family to Rwanda. Um, you moved to Rwanda with your three young children and your husband was left back in Bethesda to come and visit every <laughs> once in a while. <laughs> First of all, what an amazing adventure for your boys yeah. and for you yeah, for sure. to build those relationships, um, to meet new friends, to learn this culture, um, and for them to watch their mother at her best doing what she does and what she's passionate about. So I'm, I'm jealous. Oh. <laughs> Still time. <laughs> Tell us what led you to this decision. Um, what were you trying to gain from it to move the family uh, to Rwanda? You know, if I'm really being honest, it wasn't so intentional, you know, like I'm going to move to Rwanda, although um, I'll tell you how that, that played out a little bit. But really the catalyst for my move was the lost bid to become the CEO of Women for Women International. And it was devastating for me, devastating more than it would be just not getting a job that you might want. You know, I was in love with the mission of Women for Women. You know, these were women who had truly lost everything. Some of them had lost their husbands, their children, their livelihoods, and had their dignity stripped away by atrocities most of us can't even imagine. Um, and what really resonated with me about Women for Women was they never treated or saw these women as victims. They were always potential agents of change, capable of transforming their lives and in turn the lives of their families and communities. And that message that you know women are inherently capable and powerful 
despite their circumstances, truly resonated with me. So um, I was pretty devastated and it kind of put me into this tailspin of like questioning everything about my career and my marriage and um, some of the choices that I had made or maybe didn't make um, over the course of my career. And so, you know, I started thinking, you know, to get myself to a better place, I might actually need to move to another place. And I really wanted the boys to come with me. Um, I had been the person who had always left my entire career from the time I was married. You know, my husband was watching the kids, so I would leave. Um, and so, you know, as I was rethinking my choices, maybe rethinking my marriage, I was like, I wanted the chance to solo parent with them, but also to give them the opportunity to experience a new culture and community and really kind of understand the breadth of choices they had back home, but maybe took for granted, like, you know, all of us do. How did you, how did you make this work with your husband being away? You working full time, uh, over full time, really. You were working 24 seven. And the boys uh, basically in a new place, um, trying to get used to and learn their surroundings. Well, um, if I was smart, I would have thought about all of that beforehand. <laughs> but I was like, this was literally me blurting out in the car. I think we should move to Rwanda. And the kids are like, yeah, let's go to Rwanda. And, and my husband was like, are you kidding me? And you raise this in front of our kids? Like, what are you thinking? And so he's fuming, and, and the boys are like, Dad, why are you being so defensive? So, but, um, you know, I, it turns out we did move to Rwanda. I took the kids, but I hadn't really thought through this whole, I'm still going to be traveling and going to all these places and who's gonna watch the kids. So there was a lot of scrambling involved and it, it wasn't easy. I did have some support, but, um, you know, I, you know, there were times when I had to like tap my son's teacher fiance to come stay with the boys so that I could make a trip to South Sudan. Um, and so there, there was a lot of that juggling. And again, because I was the mother who left, it was very easy to compartmentalize my life when they were so far away and I was in the field. But we were all together. Um, as you said, it was a great adventure, but it was also, we were learning about each other in a very new way had a support group, basically, just like many of the women who need to survive. That's right. Yeah. Um, in your career, throughout your career, you've had plenty of content for a book. Um, why at this time and why Rwanda? What uh, was the reason? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the reasons I selected Rwanda, and as I was thinking, you know, I want to get to a different place, I really did this calculation of where could I go that was a safe and reasonable place to to bring the kids and uh, most of the places that we worked were really off the table from a security standpoint. But um, Rwanda was safe and I don't know how many of you guys know about sort of what happened in Rwanda during the genocide, but as you know, more than a million people were killed over the, the 100 days of violence and inhumanity there. But upwards of 300,000 women were sexually tortured and, and raped during the genocide, really used as weapons of war. But the country since that time has really recovered in a remarkable way with women really being at the forefront of a lot of that change. Um, and so uh, when I really did that calculation, Rwanda was a, a great place to bring the kids to raise them there. Um, so. um, I said that the book has a lot of stories about the women and it does. It has a lot of stories about the women survivors. Uh, People like Christina, um, uh, Safeta, and Grace and Teresa. Um, I love the story of Grace and Vanessa. If you would yeah. talk about that. It was, um, Grace's story was, was really unbelievable. And uh, she was, I, I spoke with her while I, I was living there. Grace was a 10 year old when the genocide started to happen. And, and she was surrounded by people who were being killed. And she and her grandmother decide that they need to leave Rwanda. So they start walking with a bunch of other people and they're going into Congo. They're headed towards a refugee camp there. And so um, 
as they're walking, they hear screaming on the side of the road. They see a woman who is bleeding and dying, and there is a baby on top of her, on top of her. Um, and she can't really, the, the woman can't really speak, but she motions her over to come and help her, and basically to take the baby. And her grandmother's like, leave the baby. Leave the baby, it's gonna be very dangerous for us. We can't take this baby. Other people are leaving their children. Why, are, why can't you leave this baby? And she instead, she takes this baby, she puts the baby on her back, and they continue walking into Congo, into this refugee camp um, outside of Goma. And when they get to this refugee camp, she names the baby Vanessa. And so the genocide is over, they're coming back home, Grace is raising Vanessa all of this time. She never goes back to school because she's raising this little girl. And um, at 13 years old, she tells her the truth. And she says to her, I was going to be your sister, but I'm also your mother. And if you can understand that, we can live together for a long time. Um, and what, what is amazing to me about this story is this is a girl who's 10 years old, that she had the courage, the presence of mind, the tenacity to, to do this in spite of all the obstacles. And it's just, um, I've never seen such moral courage in such a young person. As you said it, brick by brick, shocks are chagrin. Mm -hmm. That's something that you mention in the book. Um, I understood it as I kept reading the book, is this, do you want to explain what? Sure, sure. Um, so one of the things that I was doing in Rwanda um, was we were building the first of its kind women's opportunity center really as a hub for training for, and commerce for women in the community. And um, the architects of the opportunity center would talk about the building processes brick by brick. But I always thought about it as women by women because the women who built the Opportunity Center literally handmade each and every one of the 500,000 bricks used to construct the Women's Opportunity Center. So for me, it became this, this metaphor about how women rebuild their lives one step, one small change, even a brick at a time. Um. What did you learn from hearing these stories and watching what these women did? Jumping without any safety net, not knowing where they're gonna land. Um, what did they teach you about humanity, about what matters the most? I mean, I learned so much from um, not just Grace and Vanessa's story, but so many other stories um, that um, I experienced. And just for the, the little bit more background, you know, I was collecting women's stories as part of my work at Women for Women International. Um, that's part of program monitoring and evaluation where you would actually collect, you know, quantitative and qualitative data to really understand the impact of the program on you, the women. So I had notebooks full of these stories. Um, but, you know, when, uh, when I had been doing that over those 10 years, I was doing my job. I was a development professional. I was collecting the stories. I was reporting stories. Sometimes I'd write a blog with these stories. But in Rwanda, I was living there, and I was experiencing their stories in a completely different way because I was really learning about their perspectives and choices about how they were raising their kids, about their marriages, about their economic choices, um, about, um, about their courage and their tenacity. And you asked me a question earlier about like, why did I write this book now? Because one of the things that I had never done, because these stories were more arm's length for me, was to really reflect on those stories in terms of my own personal experience. And you know, I grew up in a household where my father was abusive, um, verbally abusive, as well as physically abusive to my mother and to my siblings. And you know, uh, he, my mother in particular really took the brunt of it. She was the target of everything that was wrong with my father's life. You know, he would say, you know, a missing knife, a messy drawer. Nothing was too small to escape his notice or condescension. And so. 
you know, at the time, I couldn't understand why my mother would tolerate such demeaning behavior or stay in a marriage that wasn't working. I, you know, why didn't she do something or say something? And it made me so angry, the indignity of it. And it's interesting. I started to really think about my upbringing in a different way while we were living in Rwanda, and particularly hearing these stories. And there was a woman by the name of Euphrasia who... I had met before, but we reconnected when I was in Rwanda, and uh, I was actually asking her some questions, and her husband, she told me the story how her husband beat her so hard that she ended up having a miscarriage with her first child, and he would feed her like a bird because she, he didn't feel that she really contributed financially, so it was a way of controlling her. And, and I asked her this question. I was like, why did you stay with your husband? Um, and she said, you know, where am I going to go with these children and, you know, no money of my own? And my mother, when I had asked her about why she stayed with my father, she said the exact same thing. Where was I going to go with three children and no money of my own? I couldn't go home to my own mother. Both of them had said I had no choice. And it was really then that I started to connect the dots between the stories I had heard over and over again by women. Um, and I came to realize and understand my mother's missing voice and her lack of choice. So it was really that that made me want to kind of tell that particular story right now. You know, I'm um, reading through your book and about your family. Um, it made me think about my family because I grew up in a family where my father was very abusive to my mother uh, verbally and at times physically. And, um, and I made sure, I said to myself, I never want to be like her. I never want to be like her. And she also had moments where she would say, where am I going to go and how can I leave this? And so as I was reading through your book, um, I remember many times that I said to my mother, I'm not going to be like you. And she said to me, good, I don't want you to be like me. And I made sure that I'm not like her. That's right. Well, I said the same thing. And um, I remember saying, uh, and I say this in the book, you know, having to stay and choosing to stay are two entirely different things. I never, ever wanted to feel like I had to stay. Right. And so that, that was my takeaway. Having that choice. That choice. Um, and of course, you go into it in the book, but I wonder what did your parents think about the book? The book. Hmm. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I was not going to give them the book until I was sure that it was going to be published. I was like, there's really no reason to go there. But then I had to go there. Um, and so I sent them the galleys of the book and I said, look, you're you're not going to you're not going to necessarily like it but what i will say is there's nothing gratuitous in there and i didn't do any of this to hurt you it's really was a means to be able to tell my story and what was really important to me you know so many women have shared the most raw and intimate details of their story with me i didn't want to not tell my story in an honest and genuine way alongside their stories. And I told them that. I said, this, this is why my story is in here, alongside their stories. Um, and my parents, my father read it, and um, he asked me, he's like, was I really that bad? And I said, yes, but I said, you're a really good person now. And I said, you're a great grandfather. And I'm like, nobody should be judged strictly on their worst moments, you know. They, ha they have to be allowed to evolve. And I think he wanted me to make sure I told everybody that he was a good person now. <laughs> My mother um, kind of got stuck at chapter five, which is the chapter called, uh, chapter 10 rather, the chapter called Home. Um, and so I wrote her a note saying, it would really mean a lot to me if you would finish this book because in many ways, you're an inspiration for me putting this story down and I think um, I would like that. And she did finish the book and she wrote me the loveliest note just about um, 
her, she was proud of me and proud of the boys and, and just, I'm sorry for the harm we did you <laughs> kind of thing. But um, that's probably the most effusive my mother has ever been. Amazing. Um, let's talk about Women for Women International and your move to Aquila. Um, you've shifted your focus somewhat for, uh, over what type of education and training uh, really is important and works. Um, tell us your thinking about um, how it, it's evolved over time and what is really uh, moving the needle. Yeah. You know, just from my early days uh, in the former Soviet Union on through Women for Women and then Aquila, um, the two things that I've learned that make a fundamental difference for women and girls er everywhere is really um, the ability to gain an education and the ability to earn an income. Um, and in fact, I would say that education alone is insufficient to change the status quo for women and girls. Um, because while education may give women voice, it's really the income people. Based on your story and my story and so many other stories, it's the income piece that gives women choice. And so, um, I did see that play out at Women for Women. What I would say is, because some of these women were really the most marginalized, when, when we talk about income, we were really talking about moving them from maybe in Rwanda, for example, earning 32 cents a day to earning $1.90 a day, which may seem like nothing here, but in the context, perhaps, of Rwanda, that amount of money could be life-changing, or in the context of South Sudan or, or Congo. What I loved about Aquila, um, and one of the reasons I was so drawn to its education model, was instead of really starting with the, the supply, basically the underserved women in need of skills and education, Aquila started with the private sector and worked backwards to make sure that those women were earning, um, had these skills to be able to fit into key market opportunities where there were gaps. And so um, Aquila started with 50, to 50 students about 10 years ago and ha now has over 1,000 students in the program. Um, most of them, like I said, are the first in their families to go to college. 86% of graduates are employed within six months of graduation and they're earning, on average, 11 times the national median income. But here's the kicker. 81% of them are paying for health care or school fees for other family members. That, to me, is the, the real huge benefit of a model like that. And you have brought boys into this picture as well. Men are now part of it, so talk about that. Yes. You know, um, I remember, so the men's piece, is, and it's come up a lot in the questions, like, what about men? And I think it's a, it's a good question. It's an important question. And I'll tell you a little bit about how we dealt with that at Women for Women, but also at Aquila. Um, at Women for Women, the women would come up to us and say, you know, it's great that you're training us. It's great. But if you're not training or bringing my husband along, my brothers along, my uncles along, you're not really moving the dial here, and you need to bring them somehow into the program. And with that, Women for Women started their men's leadership program. Um, and so instead of, you know, the men's leadership program work, we would identify community leaders. They could be uh, traditional leaders. They could be religious leaders. They could be policemen. Whatever, whoever was um, in a strong, and visible leadership position in that particular community or society, we would put them through kind of a training of trainers program, and they would in turn do this training for other men. They weren't hearing from me, they weren't he hearing from women, but they were hearing from other men in the community. And I remember sitting with a group of, of men in Nigeria um, who had just been through this training program, and this guy was saying, he's like, I didn't know. I didn't know that there was a different way to think about and treat women. And it just made me realize you, it, it, um, 
you have to show them a different way because for many of these men, I mean, you see that in this country too, but for many of these men, that's the way their fathers and their fathers and their fathers treated women, right? And at Aquila, um, we've been debating for a long time whether we should open up the program to men. Um, and I've personally been of mixed minds because I really see the value, particularly in highly patriarchal societies, of having single-sex colleges. But on the other hand, there's a lot of research that shows that engaging men in gender equity is really um, very valuable for women's programming. And so we just launched a co-ed brand in Davis College, so women will have the choice of being able to go to a co-ed college or a single-sex college. That is great. Um, what was, I'm curious, what was your boy's takeaway from their one year in Rwanda and what they saw and uh, men, the way men behaved and the, when, uh, the way women behaved around? Um, I think they, they've they learned a lot. I mean, and it's it's had an impact on them as, as they've grown and, and matured. So when we were living in Rwanda, my twins were 14 and my youngest was 11. Um, so they were going to school, they were engaging with their peers. This, they went to an international school, so there were kids from 28 different countries at this international school. The twins actually participated in East Africa Model United Nations, so with, with other kids. So, I mean, they had a rich learning experience. They got to meet their sister, our sister Yvette. So Women for Women is based around a sponsorship model um, where you have an American sponsor typically. And so it just happened that the woman that we were sponsoring at the time was a Rwandan woman by the name of Yvette. So I took the boys to visit her. Um, she, um, we drove out to her mud house. Um, she invited us in. She also, interestingly, had three boys, but they all appeared you know, much younger and smaller, um, and we think likely due to malnutrition. And Yvette had a very challenging life. Her husband had left a couple years before. She hadn't seen or heard from him since. Um, she, her family lived um, in a community about an hour and a half away, but she didn't even have enough money to go visit them. She had been buying and reselling tomatoes in the marketplace just to learn a little bit, earn a little bit of money. And so she was halfway through this year-long program, and she was just about to pick a vocational skill. So she was talking about what she liked about the program, and so and we're, she was showing the boys. You know, around and so Eli, one of the twins, was saying, "So, so where does everybody sleep?" And she points to the back of this house where they have, you know, mud floors on the on the mats. And then he says, um, "How come your kids aren't in school?" And she's like, "I don't, I don't have any money for school fees." Um, and so I think you know that kind of experience was really eye-opening, and as we were leaving Kai, my youngest 11-year-old, he's like, are we gonna see Yvette and her boys again? And I said, you know, I don't think so, bud, but there are women like her everywhere. You just have to look. Um, and I think that this idea that, you know, there's an underside in Rwanda, but there's an underside here. There's an underside where I live. I know in Bethesda, when I think about it, 20 minutes away from the city, girls are being trafficked an average of five times a night, seven days a week. Some of those girls as young as nine years old. DC is one of the most heavily trafficked areas in the world. And um, you know, the face of poverty in the DC area is most often a woman or a girl. And so, you know, that underside is right on my own doorstep. And how often do we miss or dismiss that here? And I suspect right here in Seattle is that as well. So I was just trying to make the point that you just, you have to look. You have to want to see that. There's a really nice picture of Yvette and your boys in the book, so it's quite sweet. Um, it's interesting because these women uh, that did your stories, uh, you tell their stories, majority of them don't have any education. They can't read or write. They don't have any uh, skills. Um, but every single one of them, uh, when they can earn some money, they put their kids to school because they value 
and they realize the value of education. And they know that this is the gateway for their kids to have a better life. Um, it's, uh, and it's, I think, true for everybody, every Absolutely, woman. I think so too. And you know, when I think about Akila, I, I know this to be true. They're like the daughters of the women for women women. And you know, a number of the girls who go to Akila, their parents, are, are if they have both parents, but at least one parents, they're subsistence farmers. And so they've given up everything, done everything, so their daughters can get an education and go on to a better life. Um, so it, it, you're right, it's, it's absolutely um, valuable. And they value it, even if they didn't have the opportunity to have an education themselves. Um, we have a little bit more time. Um, you end the book talking about the power of freedom, of um, ability to choose your own path, um, to choose your own life and who you want to be. And of course, I personally know about it uh, because um, I feel really um, a gift that I live in a place where I can choose who I want to be and do what I want to be, and no one is telling me really how to lead my life. But I want to hear it um, from you. What do you think is that ability to choose? What does it mean? Well, as I mentioned before, the, the whole idea that education and income give women voice and choice, but even more importantly, to have a life of their own choosing. Um, and I think when I when I really sort of crystallize this for me, this idea that women want many of the same things that I have found. It's one of the main reasons I wanted to write this book. This idea that across continents and cultures and war and peace, what women truly want is the ability to choose. Whether, you know, from the simplest expression of our daily preferences, you know, to some of the more profound life-changing choices that shape us as women and mothers and human beings. I have found that true for Afghan women, for Congolese women, from South Sudanese women, and you know everyone in between. Um, I re there's this, a line in this book um, uh, where I, I talk about early in the early days, there was a public opinion poll done um, pretty much at the height of the Cold War. Uh, it was an American public opinion poll that said, um, Americans thought that Soviet people loved their children less. I just thought that was so amazing, this idea that because they're different people, because they're other, they love their children less. And what I have found, um, you know, through all this work, you know, what that choice looks like may differ woman from woman, conflict to conflict, um, but at a fundamental level, we do want very much the same things, to live a life free from violence and abuse and harassment and peace and dignity, right? Um, and to give our children a better future, right? So uh, I think that irrespective of country and place, those things are absolutely true. Um, and what would be one takeaway that you want the readers to take with them after reading this book? Just, you know, that choice is a gift and a privilege that many of the wor women around the world don't share. And so, you know, it takes a lot of consciousness to really think about choice. I know that I don't do that all the time, but if the book um, helps you to think about sort of the choices that you've made or maybe the choices that you haven't made, in a different way, um, I think that would be a good thing. Um, and also, that everybody's got a story. Um, your story, what you just shared with me. I know Lisa has a story. We all, we all have a story. Sometimes we haven't said it out loud. My friend Dana here, she's like, I, we went to college together, and she's never heard this story about my parents. Um, that was the, This was the first time I've told my story, so, um, and it's and an, mine it, as well. and you're too, well, and I know in, in an era of Me Too where women are just starting to tell their stories, 
it's really important to create an opportunity, a space for them to do so. Um, and we're, I'm always surprised at how much that openness, that sharing connects us all. And that's exactly um, my feeling, that uh, everybody has a story. And I want to challenge everyone here to think about your story. Um, what has shaped you and what has uh, made you want to do more for humanity um, and be a better person? So I do believe um, everyone um, has a story and whether you tell it or not, it is, right. it's really important. Um, thank you so much. Oh, There's such absolutely. an opportunity and I'm so grateful to you and to Lisa for introducing us. So um, can I open it up to questions? First of all, thank you so much for both of you being so sincere and honest and bringing your candor tonight. It was really moving, so thank you. In working in international development, hearing all of these stories, how do you, maybe both of you even, how do you take care of yourselves? How do you take care of yourselves? Not always great. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, at least for me. The response is the same. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, I think sometimes I do a better job than others. But truthfully, you know, the straddling the developed and the developing world has been really challenging sometimes. And sometimes I do it better and sometimes I don't do it very well. And it's just, it can be really stressful. And there's a, a scene in the book where I just come back from South Sudan and I had been interviewing a bunch of women there and they were telling me these stories about, um, I'd asked them, it was kind of a, a focus group, I'd asked them how many women had experienced violence and all of them had raised their hands and they were telling me this story where, you know, they had been making this local brew, like a local alcohol, to make a little money. But what was happening is the men were coming and they were buying the brew, they were getting drunk, and they would stop on the way home to rape other women, and then they would go home and beat their wives. But these women were like, but we don't have another way of earning an income, and it was just this horrible, vicious cycle. So I was, you know, it just, it made me sick to my stomach, you know, and, I, and you walk home, and then I come home to my house in, Rwanda, and the house is a mess. And I'm like, you kids are pigs. <laughs> you know, I literally took my arm and I swept everything <laughs> off the off the counter because I just like, it just, and then I called my husband and he was telling me about these ski trips that he was taking. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm like, it was, so I mean, that's not on him or my boys. That was on me. I just, you know, it, it was too hard to reconcile those those worlds at that particular time. So, um, but I try and really remember the words of my good friend Mukesh Kapila, who says, you know, that cynicism and pessimism are luxuries, only for those who come and go, not who stay and do. Mm -hmm. And so that really keeps me positive and engaged, even when I mess up. <laughs> Thank you also. Um, what are some ways that we here at home can help change the lives of women and girls, both here and abroad? Well, it's a good question. You can answer this question too. I mean, there's, there's lots of ways to get involved. I mean, there's the Women for Women way. If you wanted to sponsor a woman, there's a, an Aquila way to join a scholarship circle and help these young women to gain an education and a pathway to better life. Um, there's the great work that, that Lisa's doing with the Every Woman Treaty. There's so many wonderful organizations doing good work. There's Vital Voices doing good work. All of them are working to propel women forward in different ways. But I think, you know, for me, it's, the answer is always like, what are you passionate about? How do you see that change happening? Um, and trying to reconcile sort of the local and the global and what's, what's most important to you. I know for me, um, you know, I'd spent so much of my time working overseas that I felt bad that I wasn't doing more locally. So I actually um, became the board chair of a group called Fair Girls that was working on human trafficking in the DC metropolitan area. And so that's one of the ways that I wanted to give back to my community. And so 
Um, I don't think there's a, a single answer, but what I would say is what I have learned. It doesn't take a lot to make a difference in somebody's life, so do something, right? And contribute, because it, it does make a difference. And stay informed, you know, uh, that's important. And bringing awareness about these issues and um, the stories that you hear uh, is really important. What an amazing conversation. <laughs> You're two of my favorite women, and, and it's just been really inspiring hearing both of you talk. And Karen, you know, we um, I, a few people have alluded to this. Um, one of the things that was so magical for me about the book when I first read it was just how open and transparent you were about really hard things in a world where so many people are posturing. You're opening with, I didn't get the job, and these were the things that were hard, and you were so open and vulnerable. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, your journey as a writer. Um, come, you know, and, and I say this partly because after hearing you share, I've known you for years, but I, I didn't know a lot about your background. I also am kind of wondering when Rosie's going to think about writing a book, yeah. <laughs> which I sounds like an extraordinary. For many, many years, but I don't think I'm going to go there. Well, <laughs> we, a lot yeah, to tell. we'll talk more about that some other time, but maybe, um, maybe you could just share a little bit about your journey as a writer as well. And, and, particularly as we're talking about women sharing their stories. Absolutely. Um, I actually didn't necessarily know what I was getting into. I think I thought I was a good writer before I actually started writing the book and realized, mm, not so much. Um, and so it was a long and, and, and time-consuming process of writing and rewriting and working with um, some people who gave me some incredible feedback, like Lisa, who looked at an earlier draft of the book and just help me get the story on the page. And one of the things I really struggled with, separate from the writing, was really this idea of how to balance the personal and the professional, how to balance telling my story alongside these other women's stories in a way that didn't, I didn't want to overpower it, but I also wanted to be able to tell it in a way that would help particularly other women, make some of those important connections. And so uh, I really, uh, the other piece of it, it was, it was a lot of work and I, you know, I had three kids. I also had a full-time job. I was the president of Aquila. And so my only writing time was really between the hours of 4 and 6 a.m. Um, and pretty much every weekend. And that was, that went on for years. Like it took me about five years to work write the book. Um, and so I did what I could to carve out the time and, and just continue to go at it and go at it until I felt like the story was something that was ready to be seen. Um, but um, it really was a labor of love for me. And I, I have been on this book tour now for about six weeks. The book came out in, in early January. And the fact that so many people are excited and feel compelled by reading this book means that it felt feels really worth it to me. It's been very gratifying, the response I've had. It is a great book. And I would love to hear your story. On that. So your question made me think. Um, we want girls to have choice. And where does that start? I blame my parents for all my problems. So I started to ponder, what is it in parenting that we can do to encourage choice at that point? Because that's the bare necessity of it. And I don't need an answer to that. It was more just a ponderance. But what I do wonder is that Aquila, is that how you say it? I'm sorry. Um, you talk about education, but then the value of income is more important. So how did you translate, how do you translate that work from education to income? No, that's great. Um, so the education income piece, I think really, it has to do with, like when we started the, the Aquila program, we really looked at the market first. And so when we were deciding what those key majors would be, we, we did an intensive work um, understanding what those opportunities would be. So the first major was hospitality management. 
um, and sustainable tourism because that is a key growth area of the Rwanda economy. We then uh, introduced a major in small business management and entrepreneurship for young women um, and have since added you know, concentrations in things like cybersecurity and project management because that's where the economy is going. And then thirdly, we introduced a major in information systems, which at the time was completely non-traditional for women to go into the IT field. Um, and in fact, when we launched the information systems major in 2014, we had a whopping eight young women apply to be in the program because frankly, you know, if they'd even seen a computer or if there was one in the classroom and there was usually one, they never got to touch it because all the men were, boys were touching the computer. And so you, you had that, but you also had teachers and, and parents saying, that's for boys. Girls don't do that stuff. And so what's amazing is those eight young women got eight great jobs. And so that is one of our fastest growing programs now. And so that's how we deal with the income piece. In addition, the education program is a competency-based education model. So it's really based on showing proficiency and mastery around s specific competencies, things like leadership and you know, problem solving, critical thinking, taking initiative, in addition to the hard skills as they relate to those specific majors. But one of those areas of competency are career competencies. And so this isn't an afterthought that happens, you know, like, oh, I'm about to graduate. I guess you should think about looking for a job. It's built into the program from the very beginning. Um, and students practice that. Students do role playing. They, they write CVs. And all students are required to do three months of internship in the private sector. Since you were at other areas in Africa that had uh, or dealt with people of victims of violence, how would you compare the victims in Rwanda and the genocide that they experienced versus just the typical violence that occurred in, in other areas that weren't being torn apart by a genocide? It's a really good question. You know, what's really um, amazing about Rwanda is the whole recovery process because really the, the genocide could have destroyed the country and they could they could still be kind of where they are um, or they were 25 years ago. I think through a combination of good leadership, um, this idea that we need to move past this together, that we want to stay together, um, has made a big difference in Rwanda. Um, you, have you guys heard about the Gachacha courts where they did the, the basically the traditional courts, the community courts, where they did basically trials of perpetrators. They were able to, the community members were able to confront the perpetrators and go through a healing and reconciliation process by virtue of this honest telling of the stories of what actually happened during the genocide. So that allowed a, a healing process. I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, but it, it did allow the country to come together in a particular way. And I think because the economy is also thriving, it has allowed people to recover economically as well. Um, and that is a big source of stability, I think, in the country, particularly when you have you know, 70% of the population under the age of 30 in a place like Rwanda. What I've seen, and not just in other African countries, but in countries like Bosnia that went through a devastating war, and in some places there, there was a genocide, like Srebrenica, they've never really gotten past that conflict. The leadership has been rotating. They've not had consistent economic development going on there. And so it's kind of frozen in time in some ways. Um, hasn't really developed, and you see like what's going on in Congo and Burundi, um, and even to some extent Kenya, that lack of reconciliation, that lack of forward progress post-conflict. I'm curious, with all of your work with women from different countries and, and different 
places from war-torn to other areas where women have been marginalized, have you seen a pattern where as women start to gain their voice or gain some economic power or something within their countries, that then at some point there's an uprising of the patriarchal system to kind of squash them down, and then it's, it's kind of fits and starts. Do you see a pattern like that? We see it kind of in our country too, where the voice gets too loud and then we, you know, got to step back. Um, do you think that's a, a pattern that you've seen? And do you see ways that we can go around that? Or is that just the way it works as we continue to evolve as society? That is also a really good question. You may have some thoughts about that too. Um, it's interesting. Um, you know, I was asked at one of the other events about feminism and, you know, um, what I thought about feminism. And I know that for many women in Africa, they, they don't really subscribe to at least the American brand of feminism the way that we've defined it. They feel like it's too bold, too out there, too like, I'm first and I, you know. Um, they feel like they have to negotiate sort of their voices, their sense of feminism in a much quieter, more, um, nuanced way to be able to engage with their families, with their husbands and their communities. And so what I've learned is that it doesn't really have to look the same country to country, that that these women are, are best placed to figure out how that should manifest in, in their particular countries because they're able to navigate things in a way that, that we aren't. And I think it avoids some of the backlash um, that you're talking about here, which can happen when you know people feel like, she's getting too big, she's not listening to me anymore, she's not paying attention to me, she's got her own money, she doesn't, you know. So I think the women have shown a lot of finesse in terms of how, how they navigate that. And even with the Women for Women program, we used to have them, because it's based with the, they get a training stipend as they're going through the program, a lot of them would, you know, go home and they'd, they'd buy a tool or they'd buy a bunch of bananas and they'd bring it into the family to show kind of the value that they're bringing to the family, that it's not oppositional, it's I'm going to bring you along. We've also found that a lot of women bring their husbands into the small businesses that they're starting. It's, it's a way to make it palatable without being threatening. Um, and I think um, I've seen that in other country contexts too. Um, it's why I think when I've seen kind of development go bad, um, when you know somebody like an American or from, from a developed nation might come in and say, this is the way it's got to look. This is the way it must be done, which is exactly the opposite of how one would approach development, which is like, what kind of tools and support do you need to be able to make certain changes for yourself in your, in your context? Um, and that's, to me, the best of development. Um, thank you both for a really uh, engaging talk. Uh, earlier today I was telling somebody about coming here and they um, asked me something about fintech and this is not a world that I live in. So I was like, oh, what's that? She said, financial technology. And so I was like, oh, could you tell me a little more? And so then she was sort of saying about the potential of using digital technologies of something like Venmo to be able to transfer money amongst people or potentially open up credit um, in places where there is not sort of direct uh, access to a sort of physical bank or something like that. Um, and given what you talked about, about the importance of financial independence, particularly for women of sort of being able to extricate themselves from violent situations, um, could you talk to both the potential and potential limitations of something like that? Um, I don't, I can't pretend that I know that much about that and how that would work, but I know that um, the cell phones and particularly uh, there's a pervasiveness around cell phones even in places where they don't have access to, you know, um, their houses are not electrified, they don't have, um, you know, internet specifically, but the cell phones have been a real game changer in a lot of 
rural communities where you have instant access to information, you have in instant access to money. Um, in Rwanda, they have um, a series of, of savings and credit loan associations where you're able to actually borrow some money. But so there's some really good models out there in terms of how the cash transfers work that could be potentially useful in, in the issues around violence against women. Um, it's a good thought. Hi, um, I'm kind of piggybacking off of um, your previous comment just about kind of the empowerment piece of women. Um, I also lived and work in Rwanda and um, a struggle for me often is um, just really empowering women to s kind of in the context of Rwanda specifically of the history of really relying on the West to come in and kind of be the saviors after the genocide context. like empowering them to see themselves as you are the ones with the answers, you are the ones with the resources in your own community, you don't need to rely necessarily on white people or the West particularly, but okay, I'm just wondering if you have any advice or tips about kind of that piece of the empowerment model with women to women. I mean, I think the president of Rwanda would echo very much what you're saying um, in terms of sort of weaning themselves off of foreign assistance. And I know he talks a lot about, you know, trade, not aid. And um, I think certainly, you know, the budget was predominantly foreign assistance in the early years post-genocide. And, and But I think it's been coming down now as, you know, Rwanda has one of the fastest growing economies in East Africa. It's growing, at, you know, between 7 and 8%. And so I think they've done a really good job of really engaging the private sector. Rwanda in particular has some serious limitations though in the sense that it's a small country, it's a landlocked country. Um, they don't have much land for commercial agriculture to speak of and so, you know, that economic piece is really, really critical and so, um, you know, Rwanda has worked hard to build a knowledge-based economy and which is why they're really focused on things like information and communications technology um, the hospitality industry, um, hosting um, large-scale conferences and other things that are going to create economic opportunity for many people that but are not specifically agricultural-based. Um, and so it's a, it's a bit of a tricky proposition, but um, I think they've made it good inroads. I mean, I think if you look at other countries, too, who haven't made as much progress in terms of that weaning off of foreign assistance, long way to go. I had a question about the racism, you know, because the uh, Rwanda conflict, you know, was uh, between, you know, two tribes and uh, it was for political reasons. And if you ever lived in the South, you know that even the United States has not recovered for, from its civil war. And uh, that's largely because of political reasons, in my opinion. I mean, it's pretty obvious, you know, with who the president is. But so I'm kind of curious as <clears throat> like what you noticed, you know, like how people are recovering from that, especially in the sense that it resulted in a genocide. It's a, it's a really good question. I mean, you're not really allowed to ask about ethnicity in Rwanda. It's actually illegal to ask people what tribe you're from, and that was done very intentionally. Um, the government has worked hard to create one Rwanda, a unified country and a unified people. That being said, people still know. I mean, and um, you know, uh, I, I remember at Women for Women, um, nobody asked about it, but you know, people knew, you know, who was who, who who was what, who did what to who. They they all knew, um, and so I think the country has done a lot to progress beyond that, but I also think that there's a lot of deep-seated hostility, frankly, just just below the surface. Um, it's one of the reasons there are nightly military patrols on the street, basically from 3.30 in the afternoon to 6 in the morning every single day all across the country. Um, I think that they understandably want to keep a pretty tight lid on things there. Um, and they've worked really hard. I mean, they're integrated, you know, government is integrated, workplaces are integrated, there's intermarriage among tribes, but I think um, it takes a really long time to recover. 
um, and it's going to take generations to recover. I was actually at the, the 20th commemoration of the genocide, and they do a big, um, you know, every April on the anniversary of the genocide, they bring people together in the stadium, and they do some testimonials about, you know, what happened, and the wailing that you would hear in the stadium. I actually didn't know what it was at first, but it's so startling. It, it and people were like passing out and they were having to carry people out. They were reliving the trauma like it had just been yesterday. And so it's it's really, it's 25 years is like a blip in history. It's just a blip in history. And you know, still you have families and communities that really don't understand how to talk about it and how to cope with it. And they've had very little trauma counseling. And so I think people live with that inside them. And um, to your question, I think um, it's it's really challenging, but they've, they've done a lot to, to rise above it. And sort of to my earlier question, it was my understanding that, you know, in terms of dealing with the trauma, that bodies were just left laying for several years, decades, where they fell, and, and how that might have attributed to the recovery from trauma if you're walking through town and just bodies are just still laying there, and how some churches still have, like, the skeletons as a memorial. But was, when did you first get to Rwanda, and did you see any of that? No, I, I started traveling to Rwanda in 2004, um, and so I've been traveling there for like the last 16 years. I didn't see that. I mean, I think they've really worked hard to make sure that there were proper burials. I know at the Genocide Memorial they have like a mass grave, and they have really worked to um, make sure that, that the people were accounted for. However, what's so interesting is over that genocide memorial period in every April for the 100 days of the, the genocide, they are still finding perpetrators who are revealing where the bodies, certain bodies were buried. And so um, it just happens that it's, you know, so many people died, it's hard to account for everything and everybody. And I don't know if it's even a resource question, but a lot of the churches, and 30% of the churches, 30% of the killings took place in and around churches, which is startling. You had people going into these churches for protection, for safety, and yet, really, you know, that's where they were actually killed, sometimes by the priests or nuns at the churches themselves. And so, um, some of those spaces have, are, you know, there are skeletons there, they are as they were. Can you recommend a book on the rising of Rwanda? Um, there's, you mean on what happened in the past? And more, I like the, I like a happy story. <laughs> so more, where, like, who's the president that brought it out of the ground? Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, there's a number of good good books that I think kind of go through the past, but also bring it pre to the present. Um, you know, Philip Gurevich is somebody who's done a lot of great writing on Rwanda and super well informed. Um, I would start there. There's also some positive stories about Rwanda, Rosamund Carr, about you know the land of a thousand hills. Um, Rwanda Inc. I mean, there's there's sort of like the good news stories, there's the bad news stories, there's the in-between stories. I really, when I wrote about Rwanda, I really tried to think of Rwanda as a, as a character in the book um, and to tell an honest story about the country because no country's perfect. They've made a lot of progress, but there's some, there's some downsides too and um, try to present that balanced perspective. Karen, thank you. Thank, thank you. you for joining us. Thank you all.